Welcome back to the Der Show. Happy third night of Hanukkah for those of you who celebrate, uh, and happy almost Christmas for those of you who celebrate that and any other any other holidays. Uh, we're waiting to hear what the Congressional Committee and Congress does about uh, disclosing publicly um, uh, Trump's tax returns. Obviously, Congress went through a whole phony uh, approach saying, oh, they didn't want the tax returns just to see what was in Trump's tax returns. They needed his tax returns to pass legislation. Oh, if you believe that, no, it, it's, it's not true. And now they want to make it public before the Republicans take over the House. And of course, once the Republicans take over the House, they'll make um, um, Biden and Biden's son's tax returns public. And, you know, they'll they'll go after Democrats. Everybody is going to now weaponize the IRS. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. Today, I have an interesting show. We're going to have a little contest, a little game. Uh, and the question is this. What is the event that has occurred in the 21st century, starting January 1st, 2000? What event over the last 22 years has had the most impact on the lives of Americans, on the lives, on the attitudes on the approaches that Americans uh, take. Um, I'm going to suggest five of them and then ask you which of those five. You could add. You could give me six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll give you five that I think there's a broad consensus about. And then, actually, I will also give you my my vote, for which I think is the most important, and I think it may, it may surprise you. Okay. So the five are as follows and early in, 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 the, in the century. Um, the attack on the World Trade Center in the Pentagon, that was on obviously 9-11-2001. So that's the first one, the attack on 9-11. Second one, the election of Donald Trump on November uh, 8, 2016. Profound effect on American life, both for those who support him and those who oppose him. Number three, obviously the covid Pandemic starting early 2020. Uh, number four, the killing of George Floyd um, uh, on May 25th, 2020. And finally, the Russian attack against the Ukraine on February 24th, uh, 2022. I don't think anybody can doubt that these five events had profound impacts. They shared in common a number of things. They were utterly unpredictable, utterly unpredictable. Nobody could have known that the World Trade Center was going to be destroyed and thousands of people killed. <clears throat> you, you knew there were going to be terrorist attacks, but the precise nature of the attack, using an airplane to direct it to the towers and, and, and destroy them, uh, utterly unpredictable. The CIA didn't predict it. The FBI didn't predict it. Uh, nobody predicted it. I actually, some years before that happened, teaching a class on tragic choices, I gave a hypothetical of what happens if we see a plane coming toward, uh, in that case, I said the Empire State Building, and um, you could destroy the plane. It's a passenger plane. It had been taken over by terrorists. You know that. But the radio transmission had been cut off. And um, you have 10 minutes to decide whether to shoot the plane down uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, which would result in 300 deaths or to allow it to crash into the Empire State Building, which would result in 5,000 deaths. Um, there was no time to clear the building. Obviously, it would just cause a panic if you told everybody to get out of the building. So the question is, do you, and I gave that as a hypothetical, and I didn't say I predicted it was going to happen, but law professors give hypotheticals. And the students were divided over that. That, of course, almost happened in 9-11. The plane that was heading toward the Pentagon um, the vice president of the United States, George Bush was president. He was reading to children. Uh, the vice president, Dick Cheney, was in charge of making that decision. And apparently, according to reports, he was fairly close to making a decision to shoot down the plane over Pennsylvania um, with several hundred people on it. This is the plane with the heroes who tried to take over, of course, couldn't, and they were all killed. But to try to prevent the attack at that point, it was thought to be an attack on the Capitol building. Maybe it was supposed to be an attack on the Capitol. They ended up attacking the Pentagon and killing uh, some people. Um, and so the decision had to be made whether to, whether to shoot it down. And before any decision could be made, the plane crashed as a result of efforts to take it over. 
by um, by passengers who uh, assaulted the uh, uh, terrorists, but without without success. So that's uh, that's as I said, that's number one. Number two is the election of of uh, Trump. Now the election of Trump has had profound impact in two different ways. Number one, what Trump did. And number two, what people have done in an effort to get Trump. Um, and uh, you can agree or disagree with what Trump did. I agree with some of the things he did. I agree with the camp, with the uh, Abraham Accords. I agree with some other foreign policy issues, economic issues. I disagree with the breadth of the ban on uh, people coming in from countries that were predominantly um, Muslim. I disagreed with his choices for the Supreme Court, but you can agree or disagree. Um, he was elected president and he has the right to make those decisions. Uh, what I worry about even more is what's happened to civil liberties as a result of attempts to get uh, Trump. The ACLU has disappeared from view. They've become a very wealthy get Trump organization, civil liberties be damned. And uh, that's become true of many academics uh, who have become utter hypocrites. Maybe they were always hypocrites, but their hypocrisy is now shown through. I'll give you a perfect example. The one thing liberals always hated from the time I was in college was the Espionage Act of 1917. That was used to go after left wing um, socialists and communists and, and liberals and radicals. It was used against Eugene V. Debs. It was used against the Pentagon Papers. It was used against Assange. It was used against um, lots and lots of people uh, on the left, and the left always hated it, but then it was used against Trump. And the same people who hated it wanted to expand it and, 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 and get it even broader. Uh, civil liberties be damned as long as you can get Trump. So Trump has had this enormous impact on our, our lives, and so his election deserves to be uh, on the list of five. Number three, obviously, is the COVID pandemic starting in early 2020. I can tell you exactly when it started because I was in Israel <coughs> having dinner with Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife and telling them that um, my daughter had just gotten engaged and she was coming to Israel with her fiancé to get the engagement ring in Israel in a couple of days. And Bibi said to me, Alan, I hate to tell you, but your daughter's not coming to Israel. We've closed the borders because of this pandemic. And so my wife and I flew to Turkey where they, they got engaged, but I can tell you exactly when it started. So it was the last days of February and the first days of March in, in 2000 and, um, and 20. So that's number, uh, number three on the list. Number four on the list is a little unusual, but um, it, very significant, and that is the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020. You'll all remember that videotape and the eyewitnesses showing a policeman um, basically strangling him, and he can't breathe, and um, people standing around telling the policeman to stop, and the policeman didn't, and, and George Floyd uh, died, and a policeman was convicted and sentenced to a long prison term for, I think, second-degree murder, manslaughter, I forget which it was in first-degree murder. And the reaction to that um, has been what's been called a racial reckoning in America, and it's uh, affected every aspect of American life. You can't go to the theater today. Um, my wife and I both love the theater in New York, but so many plays today are about racial injustice. And, you know, it's good that we have plays about racial injustice, but it's not the only injustice that exists uh, in the country. Uh, all corporations now are uh, requiring their employees to take courses in, in racial uh, sensitivity. Um, colleges are um, uh, focused more on race for admission than they are on uh, test scores or grades. In fact, there are attempts now to abolish um, uh, tests and even in some places grades and um, judge people basically not on their accomplishments, but on their identity. And uh, it's had a big, big impact. It's had an impact on sports. Uh, you remember we had a show where there were complaints that baseball wasn't diverse enough because I don't remember what it was, only 15% of athletes, of baseball players in the World Series 
um, uh, were black, uh, were black Africans. Um, many more of them were black, but from Central and South America, and they didn't count for for these purposes. But the same people who were demanding more diversity in baseball would never dream of introducing more diversity in basketball, um, where the uh, dominant number of people uh, who play are black because they're great players and it's meritocracy. But meritocracy sometimes skews in one direction or another, depending on the uh, issue that's at, that's at stake. Um, if it's basketball, it turns out that uh, on the merits, uh, there are going to be more black players. In baseball, it turns out there are going to be fewer. And in swimming, it, even, even fewer. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the reasons for it. You can have your own speculation, but the reality is that you get different racial compositions depending on the sport or depending on, on other issues. But uh, the, the George Floyd killing has uh, changed everything. And in my view, it's destroyed Martin Luther King's uh, dream. Remember his dream? I was there. I was actually at the speech. I was a law clerk in 1963, and it was just between my clerkships. It was in August of the year transitioning between clerking for the Court of Appeals and clerking for the Supreme Court. And I heard him deliver those famous words. I dream of a day when my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the quality of their character. The legacy of George Floyd is to reverse that. Um, people are now not being judged as much by the quality of their character as they are by the color of their skin. Obviously, character is, uh, counts too. But uh, identity <coughs> counts more than <coughs> it's ever counted before. And that's part of the legacy of, um, of George Floyd's uh, killing. Look, we were going to have a reckoning about race. There's, it was important to have a reckoning about race. Uh, we started our Constitution. Um, was a racist document. Uh, you can't deny that. It counted uh, people who were black in the South as three-fifths of a person. And... It um, allowed for slavery for a certain number of years, the importation of slaves, et cetera. And we obviously amended the Constitution, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, to try to cure that, that defect. So a reckoning is an order. The question is, 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 is there too much emphasis today on race? Is it really ever possible to get back to the goal of a colorblind society? where people indeed are judged based on, on meritocracy. There are certain areas of life we demand meritocracy. We're not going to pick our surgeons, our pilots, um, on the basis of anything other than their ability. Their jobs are, are too important. Life and death hangs in the balance. And so everybody wants to go to the best doctor, the best surgeon, and fly with the best pilot. Um, and... Uh, now, my belief, maybe it's a naive belief, that if you have pure, pure, pure meritocracy, without any discrimination, really pure meritocracy, you're going to get diversity. I like to tell the story about how when I had to have a surgical procedure, and it was a pretty delicate one, so I really went around to try to find the very, very best doctor in, in New York, Boston, and in the Northeast, and everybody seemed to agree on the same person, uh, and um, I had no idea who he was. I went into the operating room and, and there he was an african-american man from brooklyn and we hit it off great because you know he lived just a few blocks away from where i grew up but he was the man who was picked purely on the merits he was a, a genius technic technically and medically and he was an african-american and um, um everybody applauds uh that and it would happen more often if we eliminated all methods of discrimination, tests that discriminate, um, criteria for admission that discriminate. If we have pure meritocracy, I think we will get, we will get uh, more diversity, maybe not perfect diversity, but um, more diversity. In the end, I don't think there's necessarily a conflict between diversity and meritocracy. I certainly hope so. But uh, the killing of George Floyd <clears throat> changed America, transformed it in a lot of ways. Some, some, will say mostly positive, some will say somewhat positive, somewhat negative. Uh, there will be different views about whether this racial reckoning um, is on balance, all good, partly good, et cetera. 
Um, but nobody could disagree with the fact that the killing of George Floyd and the reaction to it um, had an enormous and continues to have an enormous impact on every aspect of American life. And the fifth event, which doesn't have as big an impact day to day on American life, but it has an enormous impact on the world, is the Russian uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine. It doesn't affect Americans. We're not sending soldiers uh, over there. There are Americans who are over there volunteering. Um, there are Americans who are contributing, but it's not a direct impact, but it has a direct impact on world order and on, on world uh, peace. Um, we had a very stable Eastern Europe um, now for many years, um, not completely stable. Obviously, the Russians went into Crimea, they went into Chechnya and other places. But general, we had uh, stability and now we have a terrible situation. We don't know when it's going to end, whether it's going to end, how it's going to end. It's a one sided issue uh, for me, at least. Uh, the Russians are the aggressors. Um, they have no right to take over. Uh, Ukraine. Maybe there's disputed areas. You could have referendum um, and, and, and um, uh, disputes that can be resolved perhaps by the UN or international courts. But the idea of uh, the Russian army trying to conquer Kiev, um, which is the quintessential Ukrainian city, obviously uh, is wrong. And, and, and if it's allowed to prevail, will have a big impact on, on world peace. Uh, the Chinese are watching it very closely uh, in relation to Taiwan. The North Koreans obviously are watching it uh, very closely. Um, and uh, um, in many other, Iran is watching it very closely. Iran would like to, of course, take over uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf and get all of its oil. And, um, uh, and if they get nuclear weapons, perhaps they will. And so Ukraine is, is pretty darn important. Um, but uh, the, the so my question now is, which is the most important? And I'd be interested in, in hearing uh, your views. So just to go over it again one more time. The attack on the World Trade Center is number one. This is chronological. Number two, the election of Donald Trump. Number three, the COVID pandemic. Number four, the uh, killing of George Floyd. And number five, the Russian attack against the Ukraine. And you're going to be surprised at uh, my vote. My vote is the killing of George Floyd. I have never seen one event have such an amazingly pervasive effect on every aspect of American life. Nothing has been the same since the killing of George Floyd. Everything now is seen through the prism of, of race, um, uh, whether it be advertisements, whether it be uh, theater, whether it be um, sports, um, politics. Uh, everything has a racial component, and everything is today identity politics. Again, I'm not on this show going to express my views as to whether it's all good, uh, somewhat good, um, on balance, less than good. Um, I think my own view, I'll tell you, is that a lot of good has come uh, from it, but it's not perfect good. I mean, and every... You know, I think it was uh, Eric Hoffa who once said, every um, cause becomes a movement, every movement becomes a business, and eventually every business becomes a racket. And um, <clears throat> I do think that um, there have been those who have exploited the, um, the business um, of racial equality, just like there are those who have exploited uh, the Me Too movement. We didn't list the Me Too movement. That could go as number six, um, uh, especially uh, we now know that uh, yesterday um, um, <coughs> Harvey Weinstein was convicted of a couple of charges, acquitted of a couple of charges in hung jury on a few charges. He was the origin of the Me Too movement, and I have consulted with his lawyers on uh, some constitutional aspects of, of the case. Um, but the Me Too movement might very well qualify as, as number six. And, and that, too, has had some real benefits and some real, real, real uh, disadvantages. Obviously, I was a victim of those uh, disadvantages, and I, I fought back, I think, successfully. But um, some of you don't think so. Some of you still 
call me names, notwithstanding the fact that the woman who accused me has now admitted that she may have made a mistake in identifying me. Um, in any event, the uh, Me Too movement probably qualifies as number six, but I'm, I'm sticking with uh, George Floyd. I think that's the issue that has become the most impactful and the most um, transitional, the most um, uh, effective in changing the life of, of, of every American and, and, and the way in which we face and confront racial in, injustice. Uh, when I was growing up, everybody agreed the goal was a colorblind society, judge people on their merits. Martin Luther King spoke for all of us when he said, um, person should be judged by the quality of their character, not the color of their skin. In those days, the color of the skin was regarded as a negative. So it's easy to understand that. Today, of course, it's a much more complicated and nuanced issue. And uh, reasonable people can disagree as to whether the movement away from colorblindness toward racial identity politics is, is a good, bad, or partially good, partially bad. When I wrote a book about it, um, my book was entitled The Case for Colorblind Equality in an Age of Identity Politics. So you can read my book and see that my view is generally in favor of colorblind um, equality uh, as an ultimate goal. Maybe you need to have racial sensitivity as an intermediate goal before you can achieve the utopia of a completely colorblind society. But there are those who don't want a colorblind society. They want race to matter a great deal and to be a factor in, in decision making. I leave that to you, but please write me. Uh, among those five, we're going to add six, the, the um, uh, Me Too movement. Um, um, tell me which you th rank them. If you want to rank them, fine. But all I'm asking you to do is vote for the most, the most pervasive, the most important one. And I'm sure we'll get uh, uh, different views from different people uh, on that uh, important issue. You know, as we approach the end of the year, it's important to look back to the last 22 years and see, and see <clears throat> what has impacted us most. Okay, let's go to some questions. How can it be constitutional when you have a group of politicians that all have the same agenda with stopping Trump from running for president? I have a question for the group of politicians in this for show January 6th sham. Why are you so afraid of Trump becoming a uh, president? Uh, what do you have to do to keep him from the people voting for him? I, I have no problem with that. I want, if he gets a nomination, I want him to run. I don't want politicians and bureaucrats to stop somebody from running for president under a pretext that he violated the 14th Amendment or some other um, uh, stretched um, uh, a law. Um, I'm not afraid of democracy. I'm not afraid of Trump. Um, I want to vote against him because I think that Biden is a better president and a better candidate. But um, if he wins, uh, that's what democracy is all about. Uh, in Israel recently, people won from the right and it upset a lot of people, but uh, that's what democracy is about. <clears throat> All of Dershowitz's thoughts are suspect when you consider he voted for the ineligible Kenyan grifter, Barack Obama, um, twice, and Hillary the hag Clinton at one point. Anyone without an ability to clearly reason in this political realm is also lacking elsewhere in his life. So you're saying that 80-something million Americans who voted um, for Democrats, and uh, including Biden among them, are all wrong. Why not just say they have different views from you? Uh, obviously, Obama was eligible. He could have been born on the moon. He'd be eligible. It doesn't matter where he's born. His mother was an American citizen. That makes him a natural-born American citizen. So even if he had been born in Kenya, it wouldn't matter. Uh, uh, Ted Cruz was born in, in, in Canada. Romney was born in Mexico. It doesn't matter where you were born. It matters um, whether you're a mother or father. Uh, were American citizens, and everybody acknowledges that his white mother from, I think, Kansas was an American citizen when he was born. That makes him eligible to be president. And I wish people would just stop this Kenya business because it doesn't matter. First, he was born in Hawaii, not in Kenya. But if he had been born in Kenya or in anywhere else in the world, he'd still be a natural 
born American citizen eligible to run for president. Okay. Remember this, people. The American dominance in this world ended when they invaded Syria five years ago. Where do people get this idea? Where, where was I the night that the United States invaded uh, Syria? Uh, they didn't. And that was the beginning of the end. America was pretending to fight the jihadis while supporting them secretly. Ah, they invaded Syria to support al-Qaeda. And that's why they uh, killed Osama bin Laden, because, you know, he would have told the truth. It's just amazing, just amazing. Uh, Assad asked for assistance from Russia, and they wiped them out in a few days. Where do people get this this nonsense from? Do people believe it? Um, okay. Um, th th those are the rumble of, of um, letters. Now, now, <laughs> now let's turn to some sensible letters um, from, from, from YouTube. Um, I learned a ton about the Constitution today. Thank you, sir. Uh, excellent legal analysis. The legislature doesn't have prosecutorial powers. The whole January 6th committee has violated the Constitution. But why is it that uh, the YouTube people write so much more sensibly than the than the Rumble uh, people? <clears throat> Sometimes they're very flattering. Um, you are truly a national treasure. Don't know how you could like Hillary. Well, I like Hillary. I've always liked her. I liked her uh, years and years and years ago. I, I, I first met her when she was a a student at, at Yale uh, Law School, and she was a research assistant for a guy who co-authored a book for me. Um, I'll be quoting the hell out of you tomorrow on my Substack. I am not a Trump fan, but I know a political hat to job when I see one. Thanks much again. Another masterclass by the elder statesman. Hey, I, I'm okay with that. I'm the elder statesman. Why so many in the Democratic Party ignore this advice and continue embarrassing themselves? Clearly, they're still suffering from the debilitating effects of TDS. Uh, I guess that's Trump uh, syndrome. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, I shake my head when you associate Santa with the Christian holiday of Christmas. Uh, many tolerate that Santa has become a distraction from the reason for the season. But make no mistake, it's not a Christian tradition that has anything to do with celebrating Jesus' birth. So I'm going to tell you a fact now that you will be shocked to hear. I own a copy of the original laws of Massachusetts. As you know, I collect a lot of stuff. I have the original laws of Massachusetts before it was a, uh, an American a state, when it was still a colony. And in Massachusetts, it was a crime, a crime to celebrate Christmas. Yes, it was a crime to celebrate Christmas. It was a crime for an employer to allow his employees to stay home on Christmas. Because Christian, Christmas was regarded by the Massachusetts Puritans as a pagan holiday. So forget about Santa Claus, forget about uh, mistletoe. The entire concept of Christmas was rejected by the Puritans and a law passed. A law passed, by the way, the same statute book made it a crime, a capital crime, execution, to um, welcome a Jesuit priest and, and allow them to hide. Jesuit priests were banned in Massachusetts. This was a pretty intolerant place uh, back in the day of Puritanism. But Christmas was banned. Catholic priests were banned. Uh, Jews couldn't hold office, of course, but they weren't, they weren't banned. But um, uh, the history of Christmas is an interesting one, as is the history of, of Hanukkah. Very, very interesting. Both of those holidays um, are, 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 are fascinating. Okay, so tomorrow I think we're going to talk probably about taxes and, and Trump. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to the Trump watch. We'll continue um, to see uh, what happens in, uh, in the lead up to Congress being turned over to the Republicans, the House of Representatives. And it's going to be a fascinating time to watch and see whether or not the Republicans passed the shoe on the other foot test. See you tomorrow.